So I thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you were able to take a lot of information from some of the speakers. Uh, and if you haven't, I can assure you that the next 20 or so minutes um, will be both inspiring and important uh, to, to hear. There are certain individuals that when you meet them and when you hear about what they're doing, uh, you, you say to yourself, they get it, they understand. And in this sense, education uh, and how that plays with entrepreneurship. Um, these next two individuals, uh, edupreneurs, if you will, um, are asking questions, uh, breaking rules, and uh, taking communities by storm uh, with what they're involved in. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce Doan Winkle with Illinois State University and Normal and uh, the United States Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship and Matt Murray with What If and the What If Conference. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. How Thank are you, you doing? Doing well, thanks for having us. Good, it's good to see both of you. I wanna make sure that we've got you on all of our cameras there. Enjoying your day? So far, so good. I'm good, good. So we've got Matt and we've got Doan as well. Yes, um, first off, Matt, let's talk a little bit ab about What If for people who aren't familiar with it. How did the concept originate and how, what does it evolve to? Very cool, um, thanks all. You know, we get asked how it evolved or how it started all the time and uh, it, the story is, is pretty standard at this point. And, uh, you know, it's this, this meeting between myself and a student at Westminster College where I'm also a professor, an English professor named Andrew R. McHugh. Um, he came in to interview for a, a mentorship for a freshman seminar project that we were having. And, uh, you know, we talked about all things. You know, it's this tiny office, no windows, in a, in a tiny campus, in a tiny, you know, tiny town of Fulton, Missouri. But all we talked about were big things. We talked about you know, TED Talks, we talked about technology, we talked about education, we talked about the future. And uh, I really don't like telling that story because uh, he ended up turning me down and working with a different professor for the mentorship. So mm -hmm. I prefer talking about like, why we do what if. And you know, we do what if because honestly, we're pissed off. Um, and we looked at each other and it's like the first thing that pisses us off is apathy. We look around, and not apathy, like sit on the couch apathy, but apathy that we're walking around right now with the Library of Alexandria in our pockets, and we're playing with birds, yeah? The other thing is curiosity. And we hear day in and day out, like, be innovative, be innovative. Well, what fuels innovation? Curiosity. And we live in a world with this, this school system, this education system that does nothing but crush curiosity. And we looked at each other and said, this is messed up. And as an English professor, I'm qualified to write poems about it. Um, but then I realized well, there's this thing called entrepreneurship, and now we can do something about it. So we got up and we started doing something. And the greatest quote came by a gentleman from the Netherlands who we were Skyping with uh, just yesterday about bringing What If to Amsterdam in 2014, um, July. So that's the summer. We gotta get, we gotta get busy, yeah. Um, and he goes, you know, I was looking at TED Talks, and, and TED's great, but TED is ideas worth spreading. He goes, I was looking at what if, what if is ideas worth doing? And for the last four years, we've been crushing it. We've been engaging thousands of educators across the world. We've been inspiring uh, entrepreneurs, and we've been working with everybody we can to get up off their ass and actually do something, not by just following the traditional ways, but to challenge the status quo and to actually know that actions do matter, ideas do matter, and ideas are some incredibly, incredibly powerful things said, don't let's go to you. You have a very unique approach to the classroom. Let's talk about your teaching and your role as a board member with the United States Association of Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Sure, so um, I teach entrepreneurship at uh, Illinois State University and um, I don't really think that's possible per se, um, but they pay me a lot of money to say that, so I have to, I have to say that. Um, but I, I basically, um, have, have given uh, complete and utter control of uh, the classroom and the whole entire learning experience back to the students. Um, so I don't um, lecture, uh, I don't deliver any content, I don't create any content, um, I don't give assignments, I don't give tests, I don't grade anything, I don't assess anything. So I don't do any of the things that your typical teachers do, I don't do. Um, I a lot create, of jealous students out there. I, yes, yes. <laughs> students, well, I have a student over here who might tell you that it's not quite maybe as fun and 
you know, exciting as it, as it sounds. Um, because I make them work and I make them deal with uncertainty and failure and all those kind of things. So I, I set up an experience and I guide and mentor them through it. Um, and I think that's the best way to teach, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, and then in my, my board role with USASB, it's an organization of uh, entrepreneurship educators and I try to bring a lot of that kind of thinking to the organization and, and try to spread that across to say we gotta stop, especially with entrepreneurship, teaching out of textbooks and you know, reading slides off a screen and that whole model. So you're a man of many projects. Yes, I am. So, so talk about a, a current project that you're working on. Sure, so um, uh, I, I have, uh, again, the student Obi over here in the corner um, is uh, connected through his father to a village in Nigeria. And um, so I, I started this project where uh, there's a company called DataWind that makes tablets for about $39, you can get them. Uh, and if any of us tried to use the tablets, we'd, we'd throw them out the window because they're ridiculously slow. Um, but for people who've never seen technology or never encountered a computer or whatever, they just you know, change the world. And so I'm setting up and trying to kind of bootstrap a system where people will um, pay about $150 to get these tablets to me. And then I am working with people on the ground in Nigeria, in Nepal, and in uh, Myanmar to get these tablets in the hands of uh, mothers and children in uh, rural villages. So, and I just found out the other day, I, now I have to deal with customs. And, you know, <laughs> Those so. customs get yeah, you every right? time. Yeah, right, they get me every time. So. Well, that's phenomenal. Well, the What If Conference, Matt, you were talking about that. Um, where does that stand? And for people who aren't familiar with it, uh, you mentioned possibility of Amsterdam. I mean, you are wanting to grow this What If Conference. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable how quickly it has grown from uh, before we weren't even a business. We were just, hey, this is a fun thing to do on campus. The next thing you know is like the feedback we got, the validation we got is like, and not just like, hey, we had a good time, but people telling us this mattered. This helped me make specific decisions, right? Um, we wanted to take it big. And uh, as we kept growing it, um, through the magic of social media, as you know very, very well, um, from everything from Facebook to Twitter to Google Hangouts, um, we start hearing more and more of these voices from places that we don't typically expect to hear it. Um, let's do this, let's get involved. Let's, and getting involved can be any number of ways and um, it usually goes from a, a tweet to maybe a chat to how do I bring this to my school or how do I bring this to my town? Um, and it's just been, it, you know, one leads to, to three which leads to however more and it's just, it's catching on. So talk about education a little bit. Where is education going do you think and I want both of you guys to answer this. Do you think, and uh, what is entrepreneurship's role in that education? Well, I think we're both in agreement on this thing of, of what we call edupreneurship, which is the mixing of, of education and entrepreneurship. Um, and as someone with a background in literature, uh, I really don't write poems, but I, I, I am trained to, to view the world through multiple perspectives. But what we typically learn is like Marxism, feminism, structuralism, and so on, postmodernism, and all these, so that you can look at one text and just read it through a number of different lenses. Um, and what I've been learning through entrepreneurship is, is the entrepreneurship isn't about necessarily starting a business. It's just another lens through which you can look at things. Um, so it's a process. And the process of an entrepreneur is, I want to find a problem. And eventually, I want to solve the problem. But before I do that, I need to fully analyze and understand that problem then I need to brainstorm and come up with possible solutions to that problem. Then I need to test them, select one, execute, evaluate, and then repeat. And this is applicable to whatever subject you're studying, whether it's a starting a business, reading a book, writing a paper, or, or doing chemistry homework. So I would like to see this coming in at, at not just higher ed, but even as low as grade school, um, to this perspective to come in. And the other part about entrepreneurship is, I, I'm going to forget, someone had the great quote about an entrepreneur doesn't only realize he or she isn't the smartest person, but they seek mentorship. Well, that's not just for the entrepreneur, and that's not just for the student, that's for the teachers, that's for the educators. And to see education as a place, again, back to these phones in our pocket, you have a PhD in your pocket, content knowledge-wise. Um, educators need to evolve to the point that they're a part of the classroom, that we are collaborating together for a, a, an end goal. And I think what better than entrepreneurship to push that attitude forward? Yeah, yeah and I, th I think with um, education, it's, it's got to become, and, and I hope it will become uh, a lot more collaborative so that it's, it's built and developed collaboratively um, and so that it is delivered collaboratively with 
you know, multiple teachers, multiple community members, multiple stakeholders. Um, I, you know, because of, of what I very passionately believe, um, the student voice needs to come first, I think, instead of adult voices who've been out of education a long time and forgotten what it's like to be a student, telling students how they have to learn. Um, and I think the entrepreneurship component is central and critical to that. Um, I think entrepreneurs should build education. Um, and I think the ideas, like Matt said, about entrepreneurship and that mindset and the way of thinking needs to permeate all of education so that people understand what it's like to be a problem solver, to, to think critically, to you know, be able to identify opportunities and leverage resources and all the things that are typically associated with entrepreneurship. And to reevaluate failure. Yes. You know, I always tell my students, yes. like, like, who cares what I give you on a test? Like, my evaluation doesn't matter at all. Like, like, the real world is the hardest grader there can be. And entrepreneurship forces you to take that test. Yep. But also it forces you to understand that just because I, I fail, that this isn't the end of it, that this is failure is where the learning takes place. And few, few things can teach that, like entrepreneurship. Right. Yeah. And, and few things, I think, um, very few things celebrate that in a way. Not, and, and yeah. you know, we don't go out necessarily looking for failure per se, <laughs> but I mean, when it happens, the really good and sort of true entrepreneurs will, will see the, the silver linings in that and will kind of take something from that, so. Failure's a great learning tool indeed. Any yep. questions for Matt or Joan? Um, this year we'll be doing it at the Blue Note in Columbia, Missouri, March 21st and 22nd. Okay. Yes, the whatifconference.com. Gentlemen right here. Uh, yeah. So I have 100 questions, but I'm going to just choose one. But uh, I, I want you guys to, and this is for the both of you, to talk a little bit about, for any teachers that are, or professors that are in the audience, what would you say for someone in that position that, wants to take that step into following your example inside the classroom, what's that first step? What's the, the thing that they need to do to get over that hump? Because they might want to do what you're doing, but sure. through um, unknown pressures or what have you, haven't really taken that leap. So what would you yeah. say to those folks? I, so I, I talk a lot at conferences and various functions and stuff to professors. And one thing I always tell them is that you know, I caution them to say that whatever it is they choose to do in their classroom, it should be authentic to them. So, I mean, if they're a really boring, dry person, then they should deliver boring, dry content because they, they need to be authentic. I am not, I don't think that person, so I don't do things that way. Um, and, and so the way I do things is not appropriate for everybody by any, any stretch of the imagination. The way I do things is also does not play by the rules of academia. Uh, and so I also have to put my asterisk that, you know, don't do what I do. Um, but, but that being said, I would recommend to any professor or any teacher to take, you know, one day, one module, one lecture, one day, and just do something crazy different. You know, just give the students control for that day um, of that content or of that delivery or something and try it out and, and have a discussion about it. Let the students know what you're doing and then ask them how it went afterwards and debrief and, you know, because I think a big part of why a lot of educators don't take those kind of steps has to do with confidence. They just, they don't trust themselves to... Be free in that. Yeah, no, and I add to that, and just one more on that is, um, as scary as it may sound, and, and trust me, this is scary to me even just four or five months ago, get into social media um, and, and go in head first, feet first, everything, uh, particular Twitter. I think I was told recently, um, my students are laughing at this. Uh, Twitter, the number one industry on Twitter right now is tech. The number two is education. Believe it or not, number three is agriculture. I never would have guessed this. But through the hashtags and different, um, you can go on at specific times where they have Twitter chats. And there are educators from all over the world embracing these questions, willingly sharing what they do, how they do it, putting you in touch with other people um, to give you the confidence plus the content on how to do this. We've talked more on Twitter, I think, probably than in real life. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts are tremendous, either live and recorded events or just going live and engaging. Um, looking, if you don't know, like stand up to your students and say, look, I don't know, but we're going to go through this together. And one of the things is if there's something I don't know, we're going to bring in a Google Hangout and there's a the teacher or professor in another part of the country, another part of the world. We're going to bring them in. They're going to lead the class or we're going to observe how they do it or we're going to communicate with them. Um, and empower your students to be problem solvers. Go, I don't know how to do this. Do you have ideas? Um, but a lot of that's facilitated through social media. 
enabling students to be problem solvers indeed. Any other questions for Matt and Doan? Last one, yeah. WC, right? Yeah. Um, CK, you know me? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but uh, the previous speaker uh, from Bluebird was saying that uh, entrepreneurship was about uh, money, and you saying that it was about uh, ideas. So uh, what was the comment? Well, do you want to go first? You have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I mean, you got to have an idea to get the money. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, you have to have an idea, and uh, I'm on the record. You can go to the Huffington Post and read about it. Um, one of my most hated cliches is ideas are a dime a dozen, because I think it's tired, I think it's a lazy, and especially today in the 21st century, it no longer has to be true. Um, it used to be true, and it's lazy, because I think what happens is people with money, people with resources, can look down at people who don't execute and say, well, they're lazy or they didn't do their job, while well, they sit back with the money. Well, the tables are turning now. And that's one of the things that we're working on fixing with What If, is to connect the people who have the ideas but are beaten down by society and beaten down by their school systems and beaten down by the people with money that tell them their ideas don't matter. And if we can bring them together and show the world that, it, that their ideas do matter, it doesn't only affect that individual, but imagine if this entire group out here and all of society is walking around instead of saying, well, shit, I don't matter. I'm just gonna play a game on my phone. What if they sat around and said, my ideas do matter? I'm going to get off my ass and do something about it. It's not just the individual. It's the entire society that improves. And that's what we're solving. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. That's why I let you go. Joan Winkle and Matt Murray, you guys both are beautiful thinkers. Thank you so much for joining us. Much appreciate your time here today. So have a good one. Thanks again.